Okay, so here's the second part in the lecture on coral reefs. Uh, first part, we were talking about general coral, coral information. We talked about the nutrition. Important thing to remember there, vast majority bulk, 97% of the energy comes from zoanthellae, and only about 3% comes from eating or capturing plankton with their uh, nematocysts, the nidocytes and the nematocysts and the tentacles. All right, so we talked about coral growth forms. That's where we left off in the last lecture. We're going through the general pattern. Taller branching colonies tend to be in shallow waters. Flatter forms tend to be in the deeper waters. They broaden out and flatten out in an effort to um, access what little light reaches the depth. So when you are on a coral reef, Generally, you're going to see these different types of coral growth forms. So you get these plate-like growth forms happening in various aspects or areas of the reef here. Um, you get some that are encrusting. They just kind of grow over and encrust and embed themselves on the reef. Uh, we'll get these what they call fallacious. They look like leaves, kind of this spiral, leaf-like almost lettuce-like pattern. Columnar, big tall columns. Uh, the massive growth forms, those are some of your boulder corals and brain corals, one that just get just big, gigantic, massive ones. Sometimes those guys get as big as uh, small cars. And then the branching. So here's your elk horn, your stag horn. They grow up and they branch out. And then occasionally you can find these free-living growth forms where it's just, oh, it's just a, a little coral. Sometimes you'll see these in the turf grass beds. Just a little coral growing here. Might be the size of a softball. All right, so in generally we'll see various growth forms throughout different parts of the reef ecosystem. Now, corals are not the only organisms that contribute to the reef formation. Other things help reefs form or contribute to it. So calcareous algae plays a big, big role in helping the reef grow. So that calcareous algae, the green algae is that embed the cal calcium carbonate in their, in their systems, like helmidia, plays a role in coral formation. So as that dies, it leaves behind the calcium carbonate skeleton. Um, coralline algae. This is the red algae. These guys are really, really, really important um, when we look at coral formation, reef formation, I should say, because that coralline algae helps hold the reef together, it binds it together. Uh, sometimes we will see the things like hydrozo <clears throat> hydrozoans, they help hold parts of the reef together because they also produce calcium carbonate skeleton. Um, coral rubble itself, you know, old coral that's died and broken down and you got these chunks of limestone, that sometimes helps build and solidify reef formation. And then sponges. So sponges sometimes cement pieces of the reef together. All right, so the um, big thing you can think about is coral reefs are living structures. They're made up of a multitude of living organisms that help form the basic reef structure. So it's not just one single organism doing this. Um, so when we look at reef structures, the reef structure can build from a variety of different things. Sediment, you know, the sediment building together. The calcareous algae we mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, don't forget about the shells of frames. Mollusks, etc., diatoms. Anything that's got a calcium carbonate structure. Let me put that here. Basically, the 
anything with calcium carbonate can help build coral reefs or be a component of a coral reef as it is building and growing. Now we talked about with coral reefs the ideal type of conditions, you know, water, salinity, um, lack of pollution, light penetration, etc. When corals get stressed, they go into bleaching. This is the expulsion of the zoanthellae, okay, the algae. The zoanthellae is what gives corals their distinctive color. So any of those variables we talked about before can contribute to stress and bleaching. So we talked about things like poor water quality, whether it's pollution, salinity, sediment, um, wave action, too much wave action, diseases, I'm just going to say etc. All these things can lead to stress and bleaching, which can ultimately be detrimental to the health of the reef itself. All right, so as we look at reefs, reefs come generally in three categories or three types. The first type we want to talk about here is called the fringing reef. This is the simplest. Oh. Okay. Fringing reefs are the simplest and most common form of reefs. They typically will develop as a narrow strip along the shoreline. All right. So if you look at the picture down below here, that is of an example of a, of a fringing reef. Okay, so you got your beach here. Here's your mangroves, rocky shore. You got the reef flat, which is just kind of this shallower area here, and then. The reef crest is where it gets very, very shallow. A lot of times the reef crest is out of water. Depends on as the tides change, the reef crest may be exposed. It may be uh, buried, or not buried, but underwater. Just, again, just depends on how big the reef crest or how high the reef crest is. Um, this is often the area where you're going to have your greatest coral diversity here is in the reef crest. You got a lot of wave action coming in here. And then the reef slope as it drops down. And the reef slope, the pitch or angle on the reef slope will vary based upon where this is at and the type of reef or type of shoreline we're looking at. And a lot of times at the bottom of the uh, reef slope is where you see sediment and rubble. So as wave action comes in, there's our wave, or storm surge, or whatever you want to call it, it can break apart pieces of the reef slope. And corals can kind of tumble and fall down to the bottom of that reef slope there and build up and accumulate. And sometimes sediment accumulates, and growth happens from the bottom of the reef slope back up. So it's a constant change. It's it's a dynamic type of environment where it is constantly changing based on the environmental conditions. Okay, but fringing reef, narrow strip along the coastline, along the shoreline. But keep in mind, it's got to have the shallow water, the light penetration. Typically, there's no influx from a river coming into this area. Um, the next one to talk about here is the barrier reef. Now, the barrier reef will also develop along shore, but further out. Oop. Okay, barrier reefs are separated by a lagoon from the shoreline. All right, now. In between the shoreline, so here's our shoreline here, here's our beach, 
in the barrier reef, there's our reef crest, is this big region known as a lagoon. Okay, so notice the bottom. It goes down, gets deep, 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 comes up, starts forming the reef, the back reef, and then you got your reef flat, and your reef crest, and then your reef slope, your four reef slope here. Okay, often in barrier reefs, we'll see these features called spur and grooves. This is where sand accumulates, kind of, let's think about like an erosion streak down the face of the four reef slope. That happens quite often in the barrier reefs when we look at their shape or formation. Um, the lagoon, it depends on the reef, you know, your, your distance from here to the back reef slope might be a mile, two miles, three miles. It just depends upon the reef. I mean, shoot, sometimes 60 miles. It's going to vary, but you have a significant distance between the beach and the actual, there it is, 60 miles, between the beach and the actual back reef slope. With a fringing reef, it might only be 100 or 200 yards. Here, you're looking at except miles and miles and miles of lagoon. And sometimes we'll see in the lagoon little patch reefs forming. These little peaks, pockets, areas, etc., where you get these little reef sections. But if you look at the basics of the, uh, the shape of the reef, reef flat, reef crest, four reef slope, barrier reef is very similar to that of the fringing. It's just much, 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 much further out from shore. Um, and the reef crest, just like in the other reef, in the fringing reef, the reef crest is generally the region that has the greatest coral diversity, most massive corals out of the entire reef aspect here. All right, now our third type of reef formation are what we call atolls. Okay, now an atoll is a circular reef. That is surrounded. Oop, circular reef surrounding the central lagoon. And sand keys and islands may actually be part of the atoll. Okay, so you take a look at this, and when we're looking at this is Glover's Reef, or we could call Glover's Atoll. The reef forms this kind of oblong shape structure here and inside of that you got hundreds they've counted over 700 patch reefs sitting inside of glovers um, glovers atoll or glovers reef but the water is fairly shallow in there there's a big central lagoon and then a big ring reef around it and then you drop outside of that and you get into some very very deep waters now, when we look at atolls, atoll formation was first proposed by Charles Darwin. So he had that hypothesis and came up with this idea that volcanic action plays a big role in the formation of the atoll. It looks a little, how else do you get this reef structure out in the middle of the ocean? You're not near land, you're not near shallow water, but you got this reef forming miles and miles and miles, I mean, way out in the middle of the ocean. So Darwin proposed this idea of atoll formation. So in our next lecture, we're going to talk about atoll formation, how these are, how these things develop, and why atolls are such an important ecological feature.